speaker is Andrew Cormack. Uh, Andrew has worked um, at, I should say, the company uh, for, uh, since 1999. The company has changed its name over, over time. We are now JISC. Um, so, uh, and initially, he was um, head of um, CERT. His current role is chief regulatory advisor and, in brackets, helping David out. Um, and he's involved in monitoring developments in law and technology and trying to ensure that these can be brought together without too much of a bump. His talk is uh, on uh, simplifying GDPR. Andrew. Thank you. And I can start with some sensitive, sorry, special category data about myself. I'm red, green, color blind. And this offers me the choice of red and green. It's the, uh, yeah. it's the one on the right. OK. <laughs> Um, that's my Twitter handle, that's the hashtag, that'll get you through the extra 140 characters that Twitter gave you the other week. Um, there's a challenge. GDPR itself, I haven't added in the 200 odd pages of the data protection bill because actually the majority of that you don't need to read because you're not law enforcement or the security services. Just the GDPR, 80 pages. In JISC, we've got about 120 services. And I reckon, though I'm a mathematician, so my sums may well be out, that we've got 150 days to go, or thereabouts. I could well understand, and say I'm not going to do sums, I could well understand if our data protection officer's response was something along those lines. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love this set of emoticons, by the way, and they are um, Creative Commons, so fire away and credit. So, how do we simplify? Oh, we've lost the builds. Okay, there were builds, sorry. Um, where do we start? Big question across all those pages and all those services. What do we need to do with those services when we work out what to start, where, where, where to start on them? How do we explain it to data subjects, obviously, to regulators? Well, we, we hope not, but it would be nice to be able to if they have to ask, if they ask us. And actually, I think most importantly, how do we explain it to ourselves? Do we <coughs> really understand? My, my two-line slide on what is the GDPR about says the Data Protection Directive asked you what personal data you had, the GDPR asks you why. Do we really understand why? And I'm trying to answer those three questions with hanging over me the prospect of some regulator somewhere producing guidance on the 24th of May, <laughs> if we're lucky. So I don't want to do anything that will Core, uh, if that happens, I'm trying to minimize the amount of rework we need. Oh, there are builds. They're here. Okay. I've been on holiday since I wrote these slides. I clearly shouldn't have been. So going through each of those in, in sequence, at least the first three, that's what I'm talking about. Where to start? Okay. Have you ever come across PowerPoint karaoke? where random slides come up and you have to talk to them. I'm getting that feeling. I want to start with the scary services. Crudely, that was our internal name for the uh, spreadsheet that you will see shortly. What makes a service scary? OK, builds, good. Service where we can't contact the data subjects. He's not crying yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. Services that are complicated. Lots of data processing going on. Maybe multiple purposes. And services that need individual treatment. Remember my 150 days to go. That's calendar days. That's not working days. We may well need to go and talk to the people operating these services so we understand what they're doing Often, I think, so they understand what they're doing. This is going to take a while. Those three thoughts got me on to, okay, how do I prioritize based on that? 
and I've since realized this spreadsheet's actually the wrong way up for this presentation, but never mind. I came up with a four-step scariness matrix. Sorry, what are we now calling it officially? Risk-based Risk -based guide to prioritization. It's the scariness matrix. Scariness one, where our relationship with the individual is direct, sorry, data subject, if you prefer, and it's an interaction. So it's a nice fixed, they do something, we do something, we've finished. Job done. We know the moment we start, or they start, what the sequence is going to be, when this is going to end. Rachel's talk about triggers. Example, help desk. You send a query to the JISC help desk. We read the query. We try and direct it to the right person within JISC to answer it. We forward <coughs> it on a couple more times. Um, and we respond. And we then wait for a bit because you might want to come back with further questions and it would be good to still have the um, original question in, in the system. But at some point after we've responded and after you've demonstrated you're satisfied, we're done. We can anonymize. Now we probably want to keep the questions so that we can look at frequently asked questions. Obvious, doesn't need personal data. Um, but this is a nice simple situation. Actually, I'm tempted to quote the ICO here where on, I think it's in the privacy notice guidance, there's a statement about you don't need to tell the user the blindingly obvious. A 20-page legalese privacy notice that says, when you submit a query to the help desk by email, we will process your email address in order to send the reply back to you. I'm not going to write that. <laughs> Scariness too. Again, direct relationship, but this is a long-term one. And these are the sorts of long-term relationships that when they start, we don't actually know when they're going to finish. So my example here is an Ed Your Own Site contact. The person at a Janet customer site with whom we work out getting Ed Your Own working, we deal with problems, we ask them how they're getting on. That relationship will continue until Either their organization stops being a member of Ed Your Own, which we hope never happens, a truly indefinite retention, or, and why it's not indefinite, when that person ceases being the Ed Your Own site contact. But in the meantime, <coughs> we've got a slightly more complicated, we might have a slightly more complicated set of legal uses about that data and legal questions about it. It's no longer simply we do what it says on the tin. We get questions about, Mm, all right, they're the Edurome site contact. Can we email them about the GDPR conference that's coming up? Um, can we provide them with information about related services? Can we provide them with information about unrelated services? Um, stuff like that. A little bit more complicated, but still okay. All right. Then we get to the Edurome user who knows they're using Edurome most of the time, but they probably don't know that that involves JISC processing personal data because their relationship is with their university or college or school. That's a bit more scary because now I'm into me, my, I can't contact the individual data subject even if I want to. And again, it's a long-term indefinite-ish relationship. This is getting a bit nervy. And the ones that are really scaring us, fortunately there aren't many, I think you said four, I, I, I'm reckoning two. Yeah. <laughs> Good, uh, definitely two. Um, are where the user is completely unaware of the service's existence. And this, uh, basically because it's what I joined the company to do in the first place, so I know about it, um, incident response. We do a lot of work on Janet because we run the network very open, we don't try and ban everything. That would defeat the purpose of the Research and Education Network. But we do try to keep an eye on what's going on on the network and to try and spot when something might not be right. And that goes on completely in the background and you should never be aware of it. The network should just work if we're getting it right. But there's a lot of personal data being processed in there. That's scary and we will be talking to them. I've already started. Um, I've already started with a 10,000 word peer-reviewed academic paper, actually. Um, so, 
That's my prioritization. I'm down to four. That's okay. And then, oh well, um, within those groups, I think there are collections that look kind of similar. So the help desk one, the ask a question, answer it, done. Feels like a common pattern. I think there's going to be a few of those. The site license light, where we have a contact with an organisation for issues relating to that particular service. <coughs> um, the federated authentication light one. EduRome, there's also uh, federated access management. We've got a thing called... the uh, name escapes me. Just, it's not illuminate. Anyway, um, or federated authentication light, done easy. Um, but there's also things like the certificate service where the site contact, anything where the site contact is introducing new data subjects to us, possibly without us knowing, and probably without them knowing. I think there's a, there's a chunk of those. So when I get the second of these, my presumption is I will treat them in the same way as I do the first. I may be wrong, but I'm hoping that works out as another simplification. Okay. So that's prioritization and how you know, a simplification in the actual number of services we need to deal with and how, how often. So what do we need to do? The GDPR provides a number of different sources of assurance, both to the individual data subject and to us as provider and to any intermediaries, you lot in many cases. Four I've got here. Um, first, there's a user-friendly privacy notice. Tell the user what we're doing, do it, done. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I have degrees in mathematics, law and humanities. Nobody ever taught me to speak user-friendly. <laughs> Sp spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> and then sent it to marketing and they put, put the commas back in. And that was about it. Um, excellent. Explaining key points, data subjects, what's going on. Then, particularly where there's a third party involved, where there's an intermediary, contractual terms and conditions. So both for us, if we have data protection responsibilities that the intermediary, the customer, is going to have to implement for us, you know, we want to make sure you do. And if this is going to land you with things like subject access requests for data that we hold on your behalf, you reasonably want to know that we are providing the systems to allow you to um, implement those subject access requests. So there's a bundle of services where these might be interesting. Then there's legal analysis, where the six bases, which I've, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been talking about information life cycles at about four consecutive conferences. I'm now moving on to a run of legal bases talks. So those will be appearing on the internet before too long. Um, particularly where the non-blindingly obvious stuff where we might do extra stuff with your data, where you might not realize we're processing your data at all. I want us to be confident we understand that we are doing this, we have a clear legal basis for this, and we're doing it in the way that that legal basis requires. Because a lot of the conditions under GDPR only arise once you've decided on the legal basis. And in fact, quite a lot of the subject rights, likewise. Now, if you, are doing con if you are processing based on consent, you've got a shed load of rights that you need to deal with. If you're processing based on necessity, necessity huh, for a contract, fewer, a bit easier. Um, so this is partly for our, be our benefit, but it will also go in the privacy notice. And then the fourth one, data protection impact assessment, um, where... Essentially, we are doing everything. We are making, doing a deep analysis to make sure that we understand what we're doing, to make sure we understand the risks that that may create, and that we can mitigate those risks, and what's left we can justify in terms of the benefits. I have two screens at home. I had this one open, and I had the scariness matrix. And I went, hang on. 
I think the scariness matrix is also quite a nice guide to which of those instruments is the most helpful. Or, yeah, which of those instruments can be plural, <laughs> can't it? So, where should we be concentrating anyway? So, for my type 1 services, I think it's all about the privacy notice. Now, it sh we shouldn't really need to be get, we certainly shouldn't need to get into DPIAs. I hope the legal basis test is obvious. We are doing the minimum necessary to do what you asked us to, um, which I would argue is necessary for a contract. Others may wish to throw rocks. Um, do we have a contract here? No, because there's not really anybody to contract with, so that doesn't work. Type 2, um, again, privacy notice. There may be a contract here, depending on the actual nature of the relationship. You know, if it's a site contact for one of the just, nego just negotiated license <coughs> deals, yes, we want a contract to make sure that you comply with the terms of the license. If it's, can I subscribe to your mailing list, I don't think we need a contract, uh, hence query. Legal basis test, here I would like this for my own comfort, and possibly David's comfort, oh, no. yeah. Um, just to be sure that we understand both what we are doing and what we're not doing. Now, if we're saying the legal basis for this is X, and somebody comes along and says, how about Y? We go, wait a minute, that, that's a rethink, that may well be a, reinform individuals. You know, that, that's different. If stuff fits within X, okay, we'll get on with it. Um, DPIA, I really hope not. Third party relationships, again, privacy notice, because it's useful to have, even if the, you know, even if we can't be sure every user's seen it. You know, if anybody queries, either us or you, you can point them at this. Um, contract, yes, with the third party. You, know, you are, we are, here is how to assign the relationship. Um, legal basis test, again, I think this is complicated enough that I would want that. DPIA, <sighs> draft one of this, there was X there, but I decided I'm not quite sure. Somebody might come up with one of these services that needs a DPIA. Actually, if the comment, Rachel's comment about we're going to publish this whether we need to or not, I think some of these services, it would be quite reassuring to you if we did do a DPIA and publish. Now, I'm not promising, and it almost certainly won't be by the 25th of May, but you know, it, it's in our mind that this might be a source of comfort. It's in my mind, anyway. Um, the corporate mind, I can't really speak for. Number four, this, I think, is where we really do need a DPIA, because there's nobody else to hold us to account if we don't do it ourselves in writing. Um, legal basis test, certainly. Contract, again, depends on the nature of the actual service, whether there is anybody there to contract with. So now I've got my simplification of what we need to do, which is quite nice. How do we explain it? GDPR, <laughs> somebody said, <laughs> it was Joe, wasn't it? You, you said the regulation is easy to read. Wow. <laughs> <I'm laughs> uh, the, I, I agree. At least to the extent that the regulation is easier to read than the bill. I have seen on Twitter a real lawyer. I'm a law student. Well, I'm an ex-law student. Um, thanks to the organization for feeling I could fit that into my spare time. Um, a real lawyer whose job is parsing statutory language, described the DP bill as, and I quote, like wading through treacle-coated spaghetti. <laughs> I may be having that for tea, but it's not, <laughs> I'm not going to give it to my mother, put it this way. I want something I can give to my mother. So what we've done I'll just check if this build, no, it doesn't build. Okay. Um, imagine the build, ignore three quarters of it. What we're doing, big caveat, pending regulator guidance, because we haven't got guidance. It's promised on transparency and privacy notices, but 
the regulators, to my mind, have failed us badly. We actually needed all the guidance by the 25th of May 2017 because most of the contracts we sign are one year. And I am confident that we have already signed contracts which will be in force after the 25th of May, which are not GDPR compliant, if we knew what GDPR compliant meant. Another piece of guidance that's missing, content of data processor con contracts. Well, gee, thanks, guys. Anyway, rant over. Um, we have a master notice. Rachel has put up a different, ver different uh, version of the, a different presentation of this information, actually. What we're required to put in there, according to the GDPR, that's the only source I've got, plus the ICO's old privacy notice guidance for the Directive Act. Um, the master notice talks about our provisions for data retention by default. You know, we will keep your data, what do you set long, three months or six months? Until a fixed period defined after the interaction between us stops, or the relationship, the relationship between us stops by default. Um, how we transfer data, the, the requirements that we po impose on any third parties to whom we are transferring data. Uh, similarly for exports, how we do security, the sorts of, the level of security we aim for, and how you can exercise your rights. Email David. <laughs> Sorry. Um, otherwise known as, we're working on it, but at the moment it says email David. That's then divided up into four separate paragraphs, and it is a paragraph for each one, which I was quite pleasantly surprised. Um, depending on whether this is a service you've requested or we're processing for to identify problems and improvements to the service or you asked us to or you're op we're operating a service for a third party. That's my best stab at user friendly. I'm hoping that one or two of you who have read the regulation and indeed the current act are going, starting to recognise this and thinking me, Article 7 or Schedule 1 or Article 6.1 because the lawyers, I hope, will notice hiding not very far behind these, necessary for contract, necessary for the legitimate interest of the provider, consent, and data processor. I'm trying to write for humans and hoping the lawyers can do the translation rather than the other way around, which I think is quite novel by observation for privacy notices. They're usually done the other way. Um, that's the master notice. There is one copy. It is at that URL, if you want to have a look at it. Um, somewhat to my surprise, no, to my colossal surprise, I went through this, I read the ICO guidance on privacy notices, I wrote it as user-friendly as I could, and I had sitting in front of me one page of A4. And I thought, wow, really? What we do have not just one page of E4, A4, for each service. And typically, this is at the point of collection, and I'll come on to an issue with that in a minute. As a minimum, we have which of those purposes and a link to the master one. So the simplest, I think, I was working this out on the train, I think the simplest possible per service notice is where we are running a um, questionnaire or a survey or something consent based, <laughs> and all that needs to go on that form is we are collecting this data because you asked us to, for the purposes of this survey, see Master Privacy Notice. Link. Done, I hope. Um, most ones will actually have two because we're usually seeking to identify problems or improvements. So there will usually be a, um, a legitimate interests one as well. And maybe, if we're doing any of these, we will also have details of who other recipients might be, with a call back to, remember, this is how we insist they protect it. Any overseas countries, note transfers. Um, I struggled for about a week to get publishing directories of video conference users into my wording for that also covered export to a cloud service provider that happens not to be in the EA, and I couldn't do it. 
So I've treated directories as a separate animal, I'm afraid. Um, whether the service is covered by our ISO 27001 certification, whether we've done the data protection impact assessment analysis for it, and there are a couple of other options. But these are coming out as somewhere between one line and a paragraph. Um, so that's good. Again, there's three flavors, well, sorry, again, there are three flavors of these. Um, if it's transaction-based, just to get the master wording right um, and not too gruesome to my proofreading eye. Um, the transaction-based one, you know, for the purposes of what you've asked us to do and then stop. Relationship-based one, until you stop doing it. Uh, and a consent-based one. And I, ha I still haven't actually finished the internal instructions <coughs> on how to do this, but at the moment it's coming out as maybe four or five pages total, including all the text. So, okay. Um, that was a pleasant surprise. And sorry, the other thing, remember my face palm smiley. I'm hoping that if any regulator comes up with an unexpected change, it will be to the master notice, not to the per service ones. If it's the per service ones, we've got a nightmare. If it's the master notice, we can edit a web page. Well, we can get a web page edited. Um, that's external stuff. We've also got employee data. Um, this one we have, we're doing second, I think is a fair thing to say. Basically because if we screw up with the data that you're entrusting to us, we've got a really big problem. We have basically lost our business. We want to get, we really, really want to get that right. A lot of the services are new. We've got new services coming in all the time. Some of those are innovative. Sorry, all of those are innovative. innovative. We do nothing that isn't innovative. Uh, that's our purpose. Um, so that's where we've been focusing. The internal stuff, we're an employer. We do employer stuff. We employ sane people. Hello, colleagues. Um, mostly. Um, so I'm hoping that actually, you know, if we're... 70, 80% done on this by May, that'll do. Anyway, it's less priority than the external stuff. So this is very much internal thoughts. Please don't quote me. Perfect, thanks David. Um, there is a scariness matrix. This can't be based on the relationship with the individual because the relationship is employee for everybody, for everything. So what I've gone for instead is a relationship based on the kind of data involved. Um, first one, and these are, these are numbered to try and make the right-hand side line up with the external one. David's version has them as one, two, three. So th this is merely, you know, as, as a mathematician, those are mere symbols. I don't, there, there is none missing there. They're, they're strange squiggles. Um, I can do the set theory if I can remember it from 30 years ago. Um, optional data, stuff that is even within an employer-employee uh, relationship, there is some stuff that is consent-based. On Yammer, we have a group for home workers. I assert that that is consent-based. We have some other stuff on Yammer that isn't consent-based, but you know, there, there is some. Uh, there, I want the privacy notice. Again, probably don't need a contract, don't need a legal basis, because it's obvious, because we're not using it for anything sneaky in the background. And we probably, well, certainly don't need a DPIA. Then we get to the stuff that definitely isn't consensual because it's a requirement of either being an employee or of doing your particular job. Um, Non-sensitive data there. Uh, so you know, the fact that I have a login on my computer, which is really nice. Uh, the fact that I have an HR record, the fact that my salary is paid monthly. Uh, that's inevitable. Uh, sorry, I may skip it. <laughs> let's, let's leave the salary one later. Uh, the HR stuff, most of the HR stuff. Uh, again, I want to notice there is a contract. I have a contract with my employer. I think we want to do legal basis tests here just because the possible uses of the information are sufficiently varied. That I, I think the legal basis test is going to be good discipline. And we, as, you know, as with the other one, I don't think we need DPIAs, but I'm not ruling out the possibility of turning over a rock one day. Um, and then I'm putting sensitive data, 
No, I haven't said either SPD or SCD because in, I think we should be treating both of those and financial data, this being the UK, not Norway, where they regard salaries as near public. Um, so I'm putting financial data in the scariest category, payroll stuff, the limited amount of medical data we hold, and again, privacy notice, contract query, depending on what the service is. Um, you know, in theory, I can choose whether or not to get my eye test funded. So there's some argument that's not mandatory. Um, legal basis test and probably DPIA is here. That's, I guess it might be a fat question mark rather than a tick, but uh, I'm expecting most of them to be. And finally, the employee privacy notices, and this really is work in progress. That's about the most developed form of it. And in fact, you could... Hmm, the italics have gone as well. Okay, the master notice, same stuff, but there's a couple of new legal bases. Um, because purposes of employment is what used to be, yeah, it, it's necessary contract. Law requires us to. There are some things that we have a legal duty to do with staff information, which we don't with service information. So reporting to HMRC and stuff like that. Vital interest is the wording from the Act. I don't think that is clear, it's certainly not user friendly, what a vital interest is. I don't think it's clear to data subjects, I don't think it's clear to data controllers, unless they've actually read the act. Uh, so I'm working on that one. I also need to go back and look at um, Article 9, as well as Article 6 on that one. Um, identify problems and improvements, and you asked us two are same as before. Per service notice, well, it'll be kind of per activity notice. Okay, I need to update those slides. Sorry, bug in the slides. Um, per activity notice, not at the point of collection. Because the point of collection is typically when I filled in an application form in, in late 1998. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff with employee data that we weren't in 1998. Hopefully, we're, doing, we're not doing quite a bit of stuff that we were doing in 98 as well. So... I can't just do it at collection point, and we're, this is active discussion as to where we put these, how we communicate these. You know, we have monthly staff newsletters that highlight particular things we do for staff. Maybe that's a place. Um, reminds on communication, stuff like that. And again, I'm working on the other options for this one. So that's very weird. Ignore that. That's the public one. Um, OK. Uh, some of my references, she probably had already, but in less, less pretty form. Uh, yeah, the ICO and Article 20, the Article 29 URL is brilliant. When are they going to get their own website back rather than being hung off a single news item on the European Commission website? It's great. Um, it's been like that for a year, I think. Um, possibly never. They're about to become the Data Protection Board. The regulation itself, um, my blog is there. Um, I've talked about service categories and privacy notices. I think I spotted this morning there are 107 posts tagged with GDPR on there. So there's your Christmas reading. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>